Hello, everyone. I'm Lee Packy, and welcome to Bloomberg Law on Demand. Today, we have Sharon Nellis and Mitch Eitel. They're partners at the law firm of Sullivan Cromwell, based here in New York City. We're going to be taking a look at the litigation wave emanating out of the credit crisis and subsequent economic slowdown. Mitch, Sharon, thanks so much for coming in today. Welcome to the program. So we have the events of late 2007, early 2008. What happened as a result in the court system? Sharon, why don't you take us off here? What's the litigation timeline? Any idea of how many cases have emanated out of the crisis and ended up in court? Well, we keep hearing about this litigation wave. I think for market participants, it's felt mm -hmm. a much more like a litigation tsunami. Mm -hmm. We saw cases start February 2007, literally hundreds of cases rolling in every single month, um, spiking in 2009. They're still coming, but they're coming from every direction, um, mm -hmm. and they're changing as they come. Uh, I read a report recently. I think it said we had something more than 1,700 uh, either subprime or financial crisis litigations that mm -hmm. have been filed in the civil courts. That's and that's not, not counting fraud or bankruptcy. That's not even counting Ponzi schemes. Huh, interesting. Uh, Mitch, you represent a lot of financial uh, firms and institutions. What are your clients making of this? Are they just uh, pulling their hair out or are they weathering the storm? What, what's going on in I your think, world? I mean, yeah, I think some of each. Um, you have no choice but to try to weather this storm, but people are um, still busy trying to figure out not only where suits are going to come from, but mm -hmm. what the subject matter of those suits uh, and the theories are going to be, because mm -hmm. I think Sharon could tell you a lot about how the theories have actually really developed. Uh -huh. And you know, you, you saw early on, uh, you know, disclosure-related cases about you didn't tell me how bad you were, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, you know more traditional things, and now you're seeing concerns about you know litigation arising out of mortgage repurchases right. and securitizations. Have the themes of the suits, so to speak, shifted over the last three years? Well, they started, as one might expect, uh, in a very traditional fashion, where you had mortgage holders looking right. to mortgage lenders to sort of get me out of this mess, and then move to the uh, securitizers and the, those bad securities that were put together based on those mortgages. Now, as long as you have touched the industry in any way, uh, your fair game. Uh, the cases are becoming much more sophisticated. We're seeing a lot of class actions. Uh, people want to be made whole on their mm -hmm. investment losses. Mm -hmm. uh, shareholders is, are suing companies saying you should have invested in that stuff. Uh, shareholders are suing the management and saying you should have known better. Mm -hmm. uh, e even to the point where mortgage insurers or you know the, the, the people who insured the bonds, the monolines are suing banks and, and the banks and are sellers suing and them the banks right back. Are <laughs> Right. I'd also like to get a feel for the amount of money uh, at stake here. Looking at the uh, the industry as a whole, what are we talking about? Billions of dollars? Millions of dollars? Well, the mortgages that are mm -hmm. at issue here are clearly in the billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. What the ultimate exposures are going to be for the financial service industry, mm -hmm. it's very unclear at this mm -hmm. time. Litigation, interestingly, has been moving quite slowly. We've mm -hmm. got years before right. we're going to know what that is. Right. The reason I ask, I'm interested to know what uh, financial companies and institutions are allocating uh, relating to budget to spend on litigation. But Mitch, you might know a little bit of something about this. Uh, are they planning for two or three years of this, or are they planning for two or three decades? Uh, I think it's it's early to say, but I think it's more than two or three years that people are planning for if the if the wide range of litigations are brought. And you know, it's hard to figure out sometimes what those are going to cost, both just to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, uh, you know, you face the problem of figuring out what your ultimate financial exposure should be and reserves, because there isn't a lot of historical precedent mm -hmm. uh, to base your judgment on as you as you go back in this. Well, mm -hmm. I think if you look at even cur even take a cursory look at uh, the quarterly reports of some of the major banks out there, you're going to see increasing litigation mm -hmm. reserves, mm -hmm. and. I think I read recently that there was about 250 class actions, that major class actions filed in this space. About 150 of them are still pending and have barely, mm -hmm. have just barely gotten going. Mm -hmm. um, so the, it's going to ramp up. The, well, a class action that passes the motion to dismiss phase, phase, which most of these have now have, mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking tens of millions of dollars in defense costs. One of the things that's been so interesting in preparing for this interview, uh, every day there's a new angle in the news flow that makes me think to myself, well, this is going to add to the pile of cases we're talking about. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the Federal Reserve disclosures, who got money for TARP. Um, we uh, did an event yesterday talking about how the FDIC currently has lots of investigations going into the uh, 50 banks that, that failed uh, since 2007. What jumps out at you guys uh, at the headlines? What do you think is really going to add to 
to uh, the, the, this wave of litigation that that's occurred in say the last two months. Uh, is there anything particular that jumps out, or is it just cumulative? Uh, well, it's very cumulative. Uh, information mm -hmm. uh, drives litigation. Mm -hmm. If it's in the headlines, people are going to sue on it. Uh, I think there are three things coming uh, that are going to drive litigation going forward. Uh, you might disagree. I don't think you're going to. We'll see. Dodd-Frank uh -huh. <laughs> uh, It's going to be a big deal as mm -hmm. that starts to get implemented, right. particularly the whistleblower uh, provisions. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know what, how that's going to play out. We don't know how... Um, some of the loose and pleading standards that mm -hmm. are buried in that bill are going to play out. Uh, we've got uh, the government and, um, and congressional mm -hmm. focus. Again, mm -hmm. headlines drive litigation. With the FCIC reports coming out sometime soon, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of material is going to be disclosed. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the third thing, of course, that Mitch uh, alluded to earlier is the mortgages. Uh, that was sort of how this uh, litigation started, yeah. all started and mm -hmm. it's come back it's mm. come back on steroids right. we got a 50 state invest uh, coordinated mm -hmm. attorney general investigation uh, and interestingly they're looking uh, at reformation mm -hmm. as uh, and looking for solutions beyond dollars mm -hmm. yeah absolutely I mean there is a systemic issue that needs to be looked at there so the government uh, through a variety of agencies is collecting a lot of information on that that information eventually may also lead to further disclosures that lead to further theories and further cases mm -hmm. but really I don't think there's anything uh, like this uh, situation that's happened the, the you know Sharon I think would point out the savings loan crisis back right. in the late that's 80s. That's I wanted to go next in relative historical terms when people say we have a systemic issue that makes me think that this is something that we really haven't seen before does this relate to anything? I mean, we, we talk about the SNL crisis. What kind of cases were, were filed back then? Is this a comparable situation? Well, in the SNL crisis, look, those, those institutions were pretty simple, right? They mm -hmm. borrowed money and they lent, you know, they made mortgage loans. There were uh, most of the uh, cases uh, involved bad behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 in a number of these institutions. So the way those, those were the headline cases. And you'll see those again. Those are the kinds of things that the FDIC investigates uh, with respect to it. But otherwise, you had securities claims, which you're going to have now. But this whole idea that the, in, the, the industry operated in a way uh, that uh, led to uh, uh, problems like fraud and losses, I think really is new. Mm. Have you ever seen anything like this? Never. The mm -hmm. savings and loan crisis is as close as we've seen in terms of sort of a litigation mm -hmm. uh, aspect, but this uh, con it, multiple times as complex mm -hmm. and as large. It's going to take, that took about a decade to work its way through so the system, the at savings least. and loan, at least. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be just as long. Mm -hmm. And the, the part that we have today that's uh, different is the, the circularity and the interplay because it's not just the plaintiff's right. bar and it's, it's we have Congress, mm -hmm. uh, we have the SEC, we have the DOJ, uh, the Attorney General, uh, Attorney General Holder was out on Monday talking about the Operation Broken Trust right, and, right. <laughs> and so long and just so long as uh, people are feeling um, unsteady mm -hmm. and people still feel unsteady. The economy is still very weak mm -hmm. uh, and on Main Street they're going to be looking to Wall Street to to make them feel better about this. You're both officers of the court. How are the courts handling this? Are, are you seeing judges just break down in tears because of their caseloads? How's the system handling this so far? Look, it's a lot of cases and the mm -hmm. courts are generally strapped anyway, mm -hmm. uh, but the courts have done a great job. The problem or the concern is that you're going to have inconsistent rulings, inconsistent judgments, people are going to be treated differently. Right. Um, but what's been very nice about the court system is it's been adding a level of discipline to what is a very emotionally charged uh, dialogue. Mm -hmm. And law and order can be very, uh, very appreciated at a time like this. In my experience with the courts is mostly indirect. It's not so different sure. than yours, right? I read about uh, uh, developments. And I, I, I have to say, I've been watching you know, not just the headlines, but the, you know, legal publications and seeing motions to dismiss and dismissals and orders and summary judgments coming out with a, with a pretty high volume of resolution. So I'm actually pretty impressed from the outside looking in at how the, the federal uh, judiciary, uh, I think, which has been dealing with most of it, has been handling it. Mm -hmm. Indeed, we've seen this very surprising, I think, to a lot of people, degree of scrutiny, particularly with the um, high profile settlements. Mm -hmm. uh, the courts take this very seriously. Great. Well, we'll have to leave it there for now. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having You're us. Welcome.
Mitch Eitel and Sharon Nellis, both partners at the law firm Sullivan Cromwell based here in New York City. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about anything we discussed today, go check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and of course on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.